Hello YouTube, this is Eric from Coder Snacks. Today, we'll talk about a question that touches on binary and file formats, making a video game save password. Let's get started. I'm glad we live in the future, when storage is reasonably cheap, and we don't have to worry about save files that are several megabytes. However, efficient data storage is still relevant, and we can learn a lot from the past. One note, this may be closer to a code meal than a tiny code byte, so get ready to dig in. As always though, before we code, we should ask some questions. While this isn't a design question per se, there are some design elements here. Particularly, what are the goals for this password? Here are some ideas. We want our password to be easy to use, so we'd like it to be short, and we'd like transcription errors to be harder. Definitely not like this. I mean, never mind the Japanese, the thing is 63 characters long, mixes multiple character sets, and uses two colors. Did you really want me to have multiple color pens lying around? We may want to make sure it's not easy to randomly guess some password by putting in random characters. Or, put another way, we want a high probability that a random password is not valid. Finally, we don't want it to be easy to guess the format of our password, so we should try to obscure it somehow. However, if we obscure the password, we should assume we're only trying to dissuade casual users from guessing it. Some people are crazy good at reverse engineering things. Let's dive into the problem. The first solution we could imagine, at least as a comparison point, would be writing out the game data in a readable way. We can use this as a starting point for writing the API we need to solve the problem. Let's naively start by taking our game object and writing it out a piece at a time to our password string. One problem is knowing when elements begin and end. Let's take a game state with 123 experience and 45 gold, and we write those two elements out to a string. If we don't know how long each element is, we can't say if 12345 is 123 experience and 45 gold, or 1 experience and 2345 gold, or other possibilities. One solution is to put separators between elements of some sort that aren't used in other places in the password. Another is to always use the same length for a particular element. For example, here we're saying five characters for each of experience and gold. These possibilities have different trade-offs in terms of space and code complexity that you should consider. For our purposes, we will use the constant space solution, which also works better in future versions of our code. For our naive solution, we'll make a list of pieces of the password which we'll join together at the end. We go through each part of the game state and add strings corresponding to those parts to our list, and at the end, join them all together and return the string. We'll also make a sample game state so we can see the various pieces in our password. When we run it, we can see that the various pieces we've added have all made it in there. Next, we need a way to read the password back into a game state. We know where the pieces are in our password string, and we'll read the parts of the string back into our game state like this. Yeah, ignore that one line for now. We'll get back to it in a moment. To make sure that we're getting the data back into the game state, we'll make a string method for this game state object, letting us print the game state object directly. Our code now looks like this. Okay, Eric, what the hell is that map zip iter monstrosity? It's a Python idiom for splitting a series into pieces of a given length, but don't memorize it, okay? Let's take a quick look. We'll overlay a Python REPL so we can see the line in question at the top. In Python, a string is a list of characters, and iter makes an object that will iterate over a list. We can iterate over the iterator and see the list a character at a time, but if we try to do it again, we can't. The iterator only goes through the list once. That's iter. What's zip? Zip takes a number of iterables and makes a list of tuples by taking the first element off of each iterable, then the second, and so on. Here, the first element of the first string A and the first element of the second string F get joined together, etc. What happens when we take the same iterable and use it twice within zip? It gets the first element of the iterable, which is 1, and then the first element of the same iterable, but we already got a 1 off, so that element is now 2. We get a tuple of 1 and 2, and so on. In the original line, we're making a list of two iterators of the same thing using a multiply. When we do this, we can see the iterators are the same by looking at their memory addresses. But what's the asterisk at the front for? 
This asterisk allows us to take a list and unpack it for use as arguments to a function. Calling zip star b here is the same as calling zip aa above. Finally, what is map? Map takes two arguments, a function and a list. It then applies the function to every element in the list. For example, here we take the math.square root function and apply it to every element of a list, giving us a list of all the square roots of the numbers in the original list. Now, what happens in our original example? We have a list of tuples of two characters that we get from zip, and map joins them together with the empty string, giving us a bunch of two character strings. From there, we use a list comprehension to turn them into the ints that we want. Now that we've spent two minutes explaining one line of code, do we think it's a good idea? Python has a lot of tools to give us compact, powerful code, but you should be careful about how you use them. If we compare this code to a simpler version, sure, we have two additional lines of code, but this is much easier to understand, not just for other coders, but for yourself in a few months' time. It's also easier to get right in an interview. Try to keep the trade-off between compactness and understandability in mind. All right, we've got a naive solution. How can we make it better? One thing to note before we go on to improving from this naive solution, this code as it is is kind of messy. First, there are a bunch of hard-coded values, which make things difficult to modify. For example, if we wanted to add a new value, say score, we'd have to add things to all these places and also make sure we modified the positions and load password correctly. It would be very easy to mess up. Let's try making the code more general. First, we make a class variable that stores information about all of the items that make up the game state. Then, we can change the init method to set instance members based on the default value in elements. We also make changes to our string method to return information based on what's in elements. Now, when we make the password, we go through each element and output the game state information, making it the length specified for each element, instead of having a separate line for each type of value we have. Loading is the same, we know the order from our elements array, we know how long each value is, and we know how many of each value to expect per type of value. We can run the code, and we can see that the game state is what we expect. This code is not better in all ways. For example, it's harder to understand, and it uses more arcane aspects of Python such as gitadder and setadder for generality. It does have some advantages though, and it's interesting to think about some of these trade-offs. If you think you will be making lots of changes to the password format, this might be better. If not, it may be better to do a more straightforward version. Regardless of which approach you use, make sure to write some tests to make sure things work when you make modifications. Other than all of this, how can we improve our solution? As it stands, we aren't meeting our design goals. Let's start by making it smaller. We can do this with binary. In our password, there's a lot of waste. Let's look at some of the numbers. For example, here we're using a character for each event, but there are only two possible values for events, and a character has way more than two possibilities. If we use 0 through 9 and A through F, for example, we could store four events in one character. If we had a more interesting event list, we could split the events into groups of four and use one character for each group. We'd save 30 characters with this change alone. We can do even better. We'll convert all the elements of our game state into binary and then convert the binary into password characters. To start, how do we convert our game state to binary? The straightforward way is to convert each element of our state into a number with a given number of binary bits. How many bits do we need for each element? We need to have enough bits that we can represent the range of values we want. For example, an item has a range of 0 through 30, which is 31 possible choices. Remember to count the 0. If we have 5 bits, we can encode 2 to the 5th power, or 32 possible choices. This means 5 bits is enough to represent all possible choices for items, so we need 5 bits. In general, the number of bits we need is ceiling of log 2 of n, where n is the number of choices we need to encode. Our 2 to the n needs to be at least as large as the number of choices we have. The number of bits for the rest of the elements is as follows. We know how long we need the elements to be, now what? In Python, we can store all of these bits in a single number. Here's how. 
Let's say we have some bits from previous elements. Now we want to add another element that's 5 bits long. We shift our current bits over 5, then use OR to put in our new element. OR sets a bit if either value is 1, but in our case, our element is zeros where the old bits are, and the password bits are 0 where we shifted them over, and we get the old password merged with the new element. We do this repeatedly until our whole game state is in this one value, as a binary stream. From a binary stream, how do we turn it into a password? We take some number of bits from the stream and turn them into a password character. We do this repeatedly until we have the correct number of characters. But how do we turn bits into characters? We can make a lookup table similar to this from bits to characters. But first, we need to decide what characters we'll allow in our password. This is an interesting usability problem. The more characters we allow, the more compact our password can be since each character will represent more bits. But the more characters we allow, the harder it is to write the password down and the harder it is to enter the password. In addition, you should consider avoiding characters that can be confused for each other. Some examples are 0 and capital O and 1, capital I, and small l. 16 or 32 characters is probably a reasonable trade-off, although a palette with 64 characters is possible. 128 is probably reaching. Why powers of 2? This gives us the maximum trade-off between bits represented, ease of writing the password, and code complexity. 16 characters can be cleanly represented with 4 bits, 32 with 5 bits, 64 with 6, and so on. While it's possible to, say, use 23 characters and use pairs of them to represent 9 bits, it's usually not worth the headache. For our code, we'll assume a 32 character palette consisting of 0 through 9 and A through Z in caps, omitting a few easily confused letters, which we've chosen for usability. Our password is 130 bits, so that will make it 26 characters, much better than our naive solution. Let's look at some code. We'll start by changing elements so that the length of each element is now in bits. We also have to change the function for event state since we'll be using binary instead of a string. Next, we'll make our lookup table for our password characters, which for us is a string. We can index into the string to get the character for a given number, and we can use find to find the index for a particular character. And hey, this reminds me, elements is a constant as well, let's fix that. Who's reviewing this guy's code anyway? Geez. We'll also add a constant for how many bits we're using per character. Next, we have to modify make password to use binary. Instead of having a list of strings, we'll make an integer with the bit set that we want. For each value we want to store, we shift the bits over and OR in our new value. At the end, we have a long integer with the bit set that we want, but we still need a function to turn these bits into a string. Let's write that. We'll accumulate password characters in a list, and calculate how many bits we're storing. This is important. We could go until we're out of bits, i.e. password bits is zero, but there might be a number of zero bits at the end, and then we would miss characters. Instead, we'll figure out how many characters we should have. For each character, we take the correct number of bits, look up the character we should use from password characters, put it in our list, and repeat. At the end, we return the characters joined together. We reverse them so that the characters are in the order of the elements. If you don't do this, you have to iterate over your password in reverse order when you load. If you run what we have so far, we get a password that looks somewhat reasonable, but as we would expect, we can't load it. Let's implement loading. First, we'll have to get the bits from our password string. This is straightforward. For each character in the string, get the index from our lookup table and push that into our number. At the end, return the number. Back to loading. Since we're reading from the end of the number, the least significant digits, we have to go in reverse through the elements, and later we'll have to reverse our value lists after we read them. The other way would be to read from the most significant bits first, which is what we were doing with the string before. This part is the reverse of what we did to make the password. We read a number of bits off the number and put it into our value array, at the end reversing it, and setting it into our game state object, which we return at the end. If we run it, we see that we get the object we expected. We're going to assume it's working here, but if you were using this in production, you'd want a solid suite of tests backing this up. This code is complex, and a lot could go wrong that would be hard to find later. 
Anyway, did all this work help us? The password is much shorter now, and the password is less guessable in one sense. It's a little harder to see what the password represents from the characters, although you can still see patterns such as all the zeros at the end. In another sense, though, we could enter a random 26-character password and have a high chance of guessing a password that our game would accept as valid. How can we fix this? One method is to add a couple of characters whose purpose is to decrease the likelihood of guessing a password at random. For example, let's say we added 10 bits to the end of this password that were all zeros. If someone were trying random letters, it's unlikely they would choose 00 as their last two characters. However, if someone is trying to figure out passwords, they would quickly notice that all the passwords end with 00 or whatever characters we choose. Can we make it a little less obvious? One way is to use those 10 bits as a checksum instead. There are a number of ways to make checksums, and we're not going to cover all of them here, although I'll put some links in the description. One way, though, is to start with all zeros, and then take every 10 bits of our password and XOR them together, and use the result as our checksum. We'll write a function to do that, and then update our make and load password functions to use those bits instead of the zero validation bits. Now, we can't always use the same bytes at the end when we guess. For example, here the checksum bytes at the end are ty instead of 00. We'd still like to make the password a little harder to figure out, though. Let's say we're trying to guess what parts of the password are. Say we change the first item in our inventory. If we do, our password changes from the top password to the bottom password. The only part that changed is the first character and the validation bytes, so this first character probably has something to do with the first item. To fix this, we'll generate some random bits, say another character's worth, and XOR every character's bits with our random bits. XOR has a nice property where if we take a number and XOR it with something, we usually get something different, but then, if we XOR it again, we get the original number back. Remember not to XOR the XOR bits because then you'll get zero. Now, even if we save with the same game state, we get a different password. Finally, to make it a little easier to write passwords down, we could, for display purposes, break the password into groups of, say, five characters. Hey, what do you think you're doing? That's better. This makes me want to break out some video games, so I'm going to stop here. There are some additional challenges you can try, though. First, try rewriting and improving this code. There is code duplication you could get rid of. Most of this code probably doesn't even belong in a game state class, like git checksum. And this needs all kinds of testing, particularly input validation. Also, who puts the same variable name in upper and lower case in the same line? There are also other obfuscation ideas you could try, like rotating the password to obscure where certain parts of the password are, or changing the XOR length to not be character aligned so that we don't have strings of repeated characters. It's easier, but inefficient, to implement this using Python's long integer capability. You could turn bits into characters once your number of bits is a certain length, or have a set length list of characters that you OR into in the proper positions. Implementing these kinds of libraries are great practice for binary. We could also reduce the amount of space we use on building extra lists, and it's possible to save some small number of bits in the password, one to two in this case, by instead of turning some of those numbers into binary doing a fancy multiply. In practice, this isn't worth the hassle, but it's an interesting exercise. One final note, this problem is complicated and involved a lot of code. If you were asked this kind of problem in an interview, you wouldn't be expected to code the whole thing in 45 minutes. You would usually be asked to implement a couple of the functions and discuss the design of the rest. Next time, we're going to do a strange kind of sorting algorithm. We've converted a list of words from an alien language to our alphabet, and these words are in their dictionary's order. Given that list of words, figure out what the order of their alphabet is. I hope you got something out of this video. If you have any questions, comments, something I've missed, or problems you want answered or covered, let me know in the comment section below. And if you enjoyed this video and want to see more like it, it would be great if you liked this video, subscribed, or both. I really appreciate it. See you here next time on Coder Snacks.